On this episode of Most Notorious, a 1935 kidnapping that shocked the Pacific Northwest. A guy grabbed him, threw him in the back seat of the car, threw a blanket over him and said, keep your mouth shut and you'll be okay. And then they drove off. And that's how quick it happened. George was two blocks from his home, walking home from school on a nice spring day. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Thank you for hitting that play button again. I appreciate you listening so much. And a special thank you to the many of you who tell their friends and family about the show. It means a lot to me to know that you care about this content enough to share it with your favorite people. Well, on to the show. It's so great to have as my guest today... Brian Johnston. He is an Emmy Award-winning writer and producer and the author of several books. He is currently the creative director for a Seattle creative agency, and he is here to share details of his brand new book titled Deep in the Woods, the 1935 Kidnapping of Nine-Year-Old George Weyerhaeuser, heir to America's mightiest timber dynasty. Thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. So how did this story first land on your radar? Well, let's see. About four years ago, I, uh, I, I like to write about things that happen in the Northwest. I'm from Seattle. And I was just researching, you know, interesting stories from the Northwest. And I stumbled across this story about George Weyerhaeuser being kidnapped And I thought, well, that's funny. I've never even heard about this story before. And I grew up in the Seattle area. And I just, you know, I I just kind of tucked it aside and didn't really give it much more consideration for quite a while because I was working on another project. Then two years ago, I decided, you know, I'm going to do some more research on this. So I started digging. And the more I dug, the more fascinating the story became. And I thought, well, there's got to be a book written about this. It's the story's too amazing. And I looked and nope, no book written on it. I'm like, well, that's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely crazy because there's so many cool things in the story. And so I decided, well, I'll take a stab at it. Oh, that's great. We've talked at, at various points on this podcast about the crazy rash of kidnappings in early 1930s America. Your book examines one of those kidnappings, a very sensational one, in the Pacific Northwest in 1935. What do you think it is about this era that emboldened people to commit so many kidnappings? Well, before that, you know, it was booze, prostitution, drugs, uh, you know, the, um, the gangsters. And that was, those were the big three. And then people started to come to the realization that kidnapping was an easier crime to commit, less dangerous, and could have a bigger potential payout. And so, yeah, as you mentioned, in the early 30s, it was kidnap central. I mean, the the country was lousy with kidnappings. It was amazing. Obviously, the most prominent one was the Lindbergh baby kidnapping and murder. But that was simply one of <laughs> many, many, many that were going on at the time. So George Warehouser is the victim in your story. Who were the Warehousers, and why were they so rich? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let me first back up a little bit to his great grandfather, Frederick Warehouser. To this day, Frederick Warehouser is probably considered the 12th richest man in American history, the 11th being Bill Gates, just to give you some context. So way back in the early uh, 1900s, he, uh, Frederick Weyerhaeuser, bought a lot of timberland, lots of timberland, lots 
of timberland. And he bought it cheap. And of course, then the railroads were you know, needed, needed to go from, say, Chicago to the Pacific Northwest. And so they needed to be able to run those railroads through the land. The warehousers had that land and said, we'll be happy to sell it to you. And that's how things started. So they got into the, the, the timber industry. Now, to give you a sense of how big of a timber industry the Weyerhaeuser family is, every other major timber industry in America combined is not as big as the Weyerhaeuser family. They pretty much own the timber industry in America. They uh, either own outright or they are the stewards of 4% of the entire state of Washington. At one time, the Weyerhaeuser family owned, this is a funky statistic, 1 640th percent of all of America. Wow. Yeah. They, uh, they, <laughs> they own a lot of land. And that is why the Weyerhaeuser family was so wealthy. But they were a different kind of wealthy. You know, back when Frederick Weyerhaeuser was making his millions, this was also the time of the Rockefellers and um, Carnegie's and the, uh, the Astors and these other Vanderbilts, super, super rich families. And he was right there with them. But his attitude was, let them take all the limelight. I'm going to simply stay quietly in my corner of the country that really most people don't know about me and go about my business. And that's kind of the way the whole Weyerhaeuser family's been since then. They're a very retiring family. They don't like a lot of publicity. Um, that's another reason why there's never been a book written about the kidnapping. Super rich family, but they always took all the money that they earned and put it right back into the company again. When this happened, which we'll get to momentarily, but it must have just been excruciating for them, uh, not only anxiety-wise, of course, but to have to deal with the press, being such a private family. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, it was, this story was on the front page of every newspaper in America. It was on the front page of the New York Times. The London Times sent a reporter to the Pacific Northwest to cover the story. It was, it, was a big, it was big news. It was really big news. And yeah, since the warehousers were not keen on publicity to start with, it was not easy for them. So Tacoma plays an important role in this story. How would you explain to listeners the relationship between Tacoma and Seattle? And what was Tacoma like in 1935? Well, Tacoma is kind of like uh, Seattle's little brother, okay? It's literally right next door. It's, you know, 25 miles away. But it's, you know, it's not nearly the size of Seattle, not nearly as metropolitan as Seattle. But that's happened to be where the warehousers lived, and that's where they based their operations out of. So uh, Tacoma still had a lot going for it. They just were not as famous and well-known as Seattle. Right. So you begin your book with the abduction of George Weyerhaeuser. Would you walk us through his movements leading up to his abduction on May 24th, 1935? Absolutely. So, as you mentioned, it was May 24th, 1935. This was less than a year after Bonnie and Clyde and John Dillinger had been gunned down. And the FBI was a new organization by and large at this point. And they were, J. Edgar Hoover was really making his stamp on the country saying that uh, all of this crime that's been going on, it's going to end on my watch. And so uh, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping happened two years earlier. And so it was still fresh on the minds of a lot of people. So George Weyerhaeuser, he's nine years old. And he and a couple of buddies uh, were leaving school at lunchtime, like students, a lot of students did. And they just, they were just, you know, going to go home for lunch. So George is walking home and he stops off at his sister's school where he would often join her. 
and then they would either walk home together or they would catch a ride with their chauffeur. I guess I say chauffeur with uh, quotation marks around it because the kids never really considered him a chauffeur. He was just, you know, uh, the guy who worked in the garden and drove him occasionally. And George got there a few minutes early and he sat around waiting, thinking, this is dumb. Why am I going to wait for a ride home when I can just walk home? It's only a half mile. So I'm going to walk. So he split and he starts walking home. And while this was all going on, the kidnappers, two of them, two of the three, had been watching him from a car. They'd been tracking his movements for the last couple of days. And I can go back and give you some backstory on that a little later on if you'd like. But um, they, uh, they watched him and it was a spur of the moment decision. They saw saw him walking and decided let's let's you know drive around to see if if he's by himself and george walks out of this hedge one of the kidnappers jumps out of the car walks up to him hey kid can you tell me you know ask him a question and george is like yeah sure i think he asked him where stadium street was stadium avenue stadium way i think that's what it's called and george was like Okay, sure. So, and he didn't even get a chance to finish the sentence. That guy grabbed him, threw him in the back seat of the car, threw a blanket over him, and said, "Keep your mouth shut, and you'll be okay." And then they drove off. And that's how quick it happened. George was two blocks from his home, walking home from school on a nice spring day. What kind of a kid was George? A really popular kid. He was a really friendly kid. Everybody liked him. Uh, he was. Uh, really outgoing. He just had a smile that would light up a room. Um, everybody had wonderful things to say about him. Uh, he loved loved sports, loved soccer, loved baseball, played on a baseball team with his buddies. He loved to run. Um, and that was, that was actually something that really caught my attention because when I talked with George, and I'll talk to, I'll talk to you a little bit about that as well, is that he loved to run when he was a kid. And so then when the kidnapper came out of this car and approached him, you know, it never occurred to him to run, which was ironic. One of the frustrating things about reading this, just about a year earlier, the Barker Carpus gang had kidnapped Edward Bremer in St. Paul. Yes. And the year before that, also in St. Paul, they had kidnapped William Ham Jr., So, again, kidnapping was a fairly common occurrence in the United States during this time. But here is one of the richest men in America. Uh, Did he have, do you know, any concern about this happening to him or to a member of his family? Nope. Well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, His dad, J.P. Weyerhaeuser, um, I don't think he really did. His grandfather, maybe a little bit more. He never had... His grandfather never really had any concerns about himself getting kidnapped, but he was always a little wary about maybe one of his grandkids, George being one of them, that might happen to them. But George's parents wanted him to have the most normal upbringing possible. And so they had no problem with him walking to school and walking home from school, you know, no bodyguards, nothing like that. It was just, that was just their their mentality. You know, he's going to be like any other kid. So how quickly did his family learn about his disappearance? And when did they begin to grow concerned? Uh, Later that afternoon, the driver, when George wasn't there for him to pick up, he drove uh, George's sister back to the house. And then he went out back driving around again, looking for George, and they couldn't find him. So after a little while, at first they thought maybe he's just out, you know, goofing around with his buddies. And then after a couple hours, they said, huh, something's not right. So they called the school and said, is George there by chance? And the principal's like, no, he left to go home for lunch. And that's when things got nervous. But then things really got bad when the ransom note showed up that evening when they got a knock on the door and there was a messenger with the envelope and it had 21 demands in it. What were some of the demands? Well, the first demand was that the uh, kidnappers wanted 
$200,000 in small unmarked bills. Now, the warehousers were rich, but they didn't have 200,000 bucks in small unmarked bills laying around. So that was a mad scramble. $200,000, to give you some context, that's about $3.2 million in today's money. And by the way, they had to find that 200,000 bucks in five days or else, as they said. Now, back in 1935, gas was 16 cents a gallon. Buying a new car cost a uh, little less than 600 bucks. Buying a house costs about a little over $6,000. And the average salary for a person in this time, remember this is during the depression, was only $1,500 a year. So the ransom was the equivalent of the average person, 133 years worth of their salary. So they wanted 200,000 bucks. Here's some more context for you. The Lindbergh baby kidnapping, their initial request, their initial demand was only for $50,000. So these guys wanted four times what the Lindbergh baby kidnapping uh, kidnappers asked for. Here's also kind of a cool little statistic that I discovered. You've heard the term a king's ransom, right? Well, a king's ransom is the victim's weight in gold. Well, George's ransom was six times his weight in gold. I thought it was pretty cool. So they wanted 200,000 bucks. They were not supposed to tell the police, ha ha, good luck. They were not supposed to alert the media. They were not supposed to tell the newspapers. Right. The newspaper, <laughs> this, this, I love this fact here. This, the, the ransom said, do not tell the newspaper. So what did the newspaper do, the Seattle Times? They posted the ransom note on the front page of the newspaper. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so and here's also kind of an interesting thing. When the ransom note arrived and the police showed up and reporter showed up also, and the police let him into the house and the reporters and the police passed around the ransom note, each person looking at it, destroying any fingerprint evidence that possibly could have been right out of the gate. I mean, it's scary. Um, you talked about the Lindbergh kidnapping. That obviously went horribly wrong for Charles Jr., and 11 years earlier in Chicago, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb kidnapped and murdered Bobby Franks, uh, 14 years old. Um, the Weyerhaeuser family uh, was deeply concerned that they would not see George again. Right? Very much so. Very much so. Um, and that's why they just huddled together trying to figure out what they wanted to do. And they basically told the FBI to back off. They said, we are going to try to handle this ourselves and you cannot do anything until we've made the ransom drop. And the FBI said, deal, we'll, we'll go along with that. Here was another interesting thing. Part of the demands was that the, the, uh, the kidnappers said that they would communicate with the family. I should say the other way around. The family would communicate with the kidnappers using personal ads in the Seattle Post Intelligence or newspaper. So when the family was ready to make the payment, they would place a personal ad in the paper saying something like, we're ready. And then they would sign it with a code name, Percy Minnie. So every day the kidnappers would flip through the newspaper and go to the personal ads and they would look for an ad with the name Percy Minnie. And then they would know that that was a message from the Weyerhaeuser family with, you know, whether they're ready to pay or not. So I thought that was pretty cool. So many things in this, so many things in this book, in this story, were like, you know, they're out of a, a Philip Marlowe story, you know, a Dashiell Hammett story. It's just all these wonderful, cool little bits of information that I kept stumbling across. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Do you have any idea why <laughs> the name Percy Minnie? <laughs> no, no one seems to know why they came up with that name. I think it was just a random name. And the, the kidnappers, they signed the ransom note, egoist, egoist. No reason, 
They just thought it sounded clever and interesting and, and cryptic. Egoist, Egoist, and Percy Minnie. Yeah, I got the impression reading your book that these kidnappers believed that they were much smarter than they actually were. <laughs> yes, very much so. They were, well, let's talk about a little bit about the kidnappers if you'd like. Sure. The kidnappers were, th there were three of them, kind of, two and a half, I would have to say. The main one was a, a career bank robber by the name of William Mahan, alias William Daynard, alias Swede Davis. And his sidekick was a kind of a petty criminal by the name of Harmon Whaley. And his wife, Margaret, 19-year-old Mormon girl who's never been in trouble in her life. But being that she is of the Mormon faith, she was raised to do anything her husband told her to do. How did they all come to meet? William, uh, Bill Mahan and Harmon actually met in prison when uh, Bill Mahan was in for like, like 20 years for something for like a bank robbery. And Harmon Whaley was in for like a couple of years for something small. And so they met there. And then uh, William Mahan got out. Uh, he got out like after just a couple of years. He basically sweet talked his way out of prison. And uh, Harmon and Margaret lived in Salt Lake City. And Harmon was just out and just ran into Bill Mann, just ran into him on the street and brought him back to their house to have dinner. And Bill Mann was, he was a really charismatic guy, really charismatic. He was, he was just, he would become the center of attention. And they went out to dinner and had a great time, went out for drinks. Well, kind of went out for drinks. Margaret didn't drink, obviously. And the next day, William said, I've got this great idea. I'm going to be going up to Spokane, Washington to, you know, to make sales for this company that he allegedly worked for. And he really didn't. And he told Harmon and Margaret, you know, you should come with me and I could probably get Harmon a job because Harmon was unemployed. And Harmon and Margaret were like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Because they had six dollars total to their name. That's all they had. So they drive up to Spokane, and on the way up there, they stop in Idaho, and Bill Mann goes to this garage, opens a garage, and there's a second car, again, 1935 Depression, who's got two cars. He's like, yeah, this is my other car. You can drive it. And they're like, oh, my God, who is this guy? Sure, this is great. <laughs> so they all went up to Spokane, rented a house together, and then Bill Mann's like, hey, let's go back uh, west to uh, into uh, – you know, to Seattle area and to Hoquiam over on the coast where, uh, where Harmon actually grew up. And um, he says, like, we can do some sales there and I can maybe train Harmon. So they get over there and Margaret's just twiddling her thumbs, reading books and playing, you know, canasta. And while this is going on, Bill Mahan and Harmon Whaley are out casing banks to do bank jobs. And then uh, on the way back, uh, Bill Mahan takes Harmon off on the side side trip into the woods. To there's there's this hole dug in the ground. It's basically the size of a grave, way out in the forest. And he dug it because he was planning on kidnapping some dude in Seattle and was going to put him there, you know, and keep him hidden away there in the underground. But he'd found out that the guy didn't have any money, and so he, he abandoned that idea. So when they get back to Spokane. Margaret's just flipping through the newspaper and she sees this article about George's uh, grandfather, you know, who had just died recently. Super rich guy just dies. And he, she just mentions it in passing to her husband and Bill Mahan. And Bill Mahan, his ears perk up and he's like, okay, this is interesting. Hey guys, tomorrow we're going to go back to Seattle again brings him back to Seattle, and then he starts going, let's go find out if the warehousers have any grandkids or any kids, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how they started tracking George, and that's how George got kidnapped because Harmon, Harmon Whaley's wife, Margaret, happened to just read this random article about how a guy died, and they went, hmm, I see an opportunity to make some money. 
So this was premeditated. Um, it was. They weren't professional kidnappers. And the, the day of the kidnapping, it was almost by chance, right, that they encountered George. Yep, exactly. Sometimes he would walk, sometimes he'd get a ride. And they tracked him for a couple of days. It was actually he and his older brother. And they weren't sure which one was George and, and you know, who was the older, who was the younger. Okay, that kid looks smaller. He's probably the younger. And they just weren't sure which one to grab, honestly. They just knew that they were going to try to grab a warehouser kid because they were easy to kidnap, I guess. And George just happened to be the unlucky one that they tracked and followed. And, and he, they found him alone and bingo, boom. They hadn't, uh, they'd only been tracking him for just a, gosh, a couple of days. So yeah, this was not something that was planned out for weeks or months in advance. This was a, a crime of opportunity. So this was in broad daylight. Were there any witnesses? Nope, no witnesses. It was on a side street. I actually went down to take a look at it, and I, I stood on the exact spot where he got grabbed. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's tucked away a little bit, um, especially probably in 1935. It would have been even less populated. But yeah, it was uh, you know 12 in the afternoon on a sunny day. Does the area look the same now as it did in, in 1935? Uh, a lot of the, you know, it's funny, the, uh, some of the streets in that neighborhood you know, are, are still cobblestone, which I found interesting. But obviously it's much more uh, grown up, many more houses now than there were back then. But uh, it's a pretty, it's a reasonably wealthy neighborhood. Um, I walked over to where George's house was and it looks pretty much the same, just a different color. But yeah, just two blocks from his house, just snatched off the street. Was it, uh, is it a pretentious house? No, no. His, his grandfather's house, which is called Hathaway Hall, that's, I don't want to say pretentious. It's beautiful. It looks like a castle overlooking Commencement Bay, overlooking Puget Sound. Beautiful, beautiful home. Big, all brick Tudor. But George's house, again, it's up on the hill, overlooking beautiful view, but it's not a pretentious house. It's just um, a nice, probably for 1935, would have been considered a very, very nice house, a rich house. But nowadays, it's just a nice, very nice home. So what did they do with George? What was his experience being taken by these people? The kidnappers, the kidnappers took George um, off into the woods, into the forest. Ironically, it was probably a forest owned by their family. And they kept George hidden in that pit. Um, like I said, about the size of a grave, about uh, five feet deep, six feet long, three feet wide. And they chained him to the bottom. They chained him inside this pit and then they covered it up and they kept him there for a couple of days and they would travel between the Seattle area and Spokane, which is where they took him next. They kept him locked in the trunk of the car. And it's about a five hour drive each way. And along the way they would stop and they'd keep him chained to a tree. And then when they got to us back to Spokane, they rented a house I thought this was cool. They rented the house from a local pastor. So the kidnappers rented it from the pastor and the pastor didn't know that they were kidnappers and told them, I want you to take good care of my lawn. I don't want it going brown. So you take care of it and water it. And they're like, yes, ma'am, we will do that. And so they made sure that they watered the lawn to keep it nice looking <laughs> while they kept a child kidnapped inside, locked up in a closet. And they kept George locked in a closet for a week. Well, Obviously, this is child abuse, but were they violent towards him? No. According to George, they were not. The one guy, Will May, uh, Bill Mahan, scared, he, he, he scared George because he was the wild card. But Harmon Whaley, he said that Harmon Whaley was actually a reasonable guy to him because Harmon was the one who was kind of on guard watching him for the better part of the week while Bill Mahan was racing back and forth between Seattle and Spokane, you know, trying to get the ransom money and stuff and 
communicating with the family. But George said that, uh, that Harmon was not a bad guy, at least in his opinion. So why didn't George try to escape? Well, because they said, if you try to escape, we're going to hurt you. And Bill Mahan had a gun, actually two guns. And that's another reason why Margaret Whaley didn't uh, blow the whistle on him, too, because Bill Mahan said, if you say anything, I will kill you, I will kill your husband, and I'll kill the boy. And so she, uh, she kept her mouth shut. What was really interesting about Margaret is that during the entire time that they had George, she never once saw George, and George never once saw her. Harmon and Bill made it a point to keep it so that they couldn't, she could never see him. So like when they took George out of the hole in the ground in the forest and put him in the trunk of the car, they would, again, she didn't know that they had the boy. She had no clue for the first few days. So she's sitting in the car and all of a sudden her husband comes out of the woods and says, okay, I'm going to ask you something very strange. I want you to get on your knees on the front seat, put your head down, and I'm going to fold the seat over you. And she's like, what? He says, yeah, I want you to just do that. Well, she's like, okay, because she does whatever her husband tells her to. She curls up into a little ball on the front seat. He folds the seat down over her. And then all of a sudden she hears the trunk slam. She doesn't know that a nine-year-old boy is now in the trunk of the car. And as they're driving across the state, they stop somewhere to get gas. And all of a sudden, she hears this voice out of the trunk saying, hey, mister, can I get out now? <laughs> and she's like, what the hell? What's going on? <laughs> and that's when Bill Mahan says, and all the pieces fell together. And she's like, oh, crap. And that's when he pulled out the gun and said, you're going to keep your mouth shut. You're not going to ask any questions or it's curtains. So George is a really smart boy. What did he pay attention to? What, what information was he able to gather to help investigators later? Well, he, uh, he kind of timed in his head when he was kidnapped to where he was uh, dropped off into, that, into the forest. And he figured it was about an hour drive. And he also sensed that the car was in high gear and it was driving on smooth pavement. So that kind of told the, the police and the FBI that they were driving on highways, highway roads. And then when he was, uh, he was in, the, in the ground in one hole and then he was taken to another hole and he could hear a train not too far away. Then when he was taken to Spokane, he kind of counted the steps from where the car was to the house, which was about 10 steps, and how many steps up into the house and how many doors they would go through in the house because he was kept, um, they kept him in a box where they kept him blindfolded when they would bring him from the car into the house or from the house into the car. And he could hear the kids next door playing tag. So here he is, blindfolded, kidnapped, and he could hear little kids his own age, probably 50 feet away, playing tag. Wow. Did the fact that the kidnappers, by sending notes through the, the U.S. mail, did that matter in, in bringing in the feds? Or, or was it more that the family was so incredibly rich that J. Edgar Hoover was, of course, going to get involved. Yes, and he was very interested. He took a very, very particular interest in this. But the only reason that uh, the, the federal issue came up was because when they were taking George, and, and this is still, this is so strange too. They're driving from Seattle, west side of, of the state, to Spokane, east side of the state. But they drove up to Spokane, and then they drove into just briefly into Idaho. I mean, briefly into Idaho. They didn't even really spend a night there. They just kind of went into Idaho. I think it was uh, Newman Lake, Lake Newman. 
which is literally less than 10 miles across the border. They stayed there for a little while, and then they drove back into, uh, into Spokane. By doing that, they crossed state lines uh, with the kidnap victim. And that's how it became a federal offense right there. These guys really made an effort to be elusive, right? To be clever. Um, but when they created this series of notes uh, for the family to follow. <laughs> yes. Oh, this was terrific. I mean, this, again, this is right out of a movie. So George's dad and his uncle are staying in a hotel in downtown Seattle. That's what the, the, the kidnappers told them to do. And they were to stay under the name, I think it was uh, John Paul Jones or something like that. And so the kidnappers sent a letter to him saying, here's where you're going to make the drop. You're going to drive to this one location, which is basically halfway between Seattle and, uh, and Tacoma. And you're going to go to this abandoned house. And in the yard, you'll find a little stick in the ground with a little piece of fabric attached to it. So it's kind of like a little white flag. And under that, you'll see a tin can. And inside the tin can, you'll find a note that she'll take you to the next location. And so George's dad at night, he's got the money in a suitcase, all 40 pounds of it. And he drives to this, this house and he finds the stick with the little white flag and he finds the tin can and he finds the note and it says drive 700 yards to this next location. So he drives to the next location and he finds the little note and he finds, or excuse me, he finds the little stick with a flag attached to it but there's no tin can and there's no note and he's got to make that delivery that day or the deal's off. So he's crawling around in the dark with matches, trying to find this note that tells him where to make the next drop. And he searches for a couple hours. He can't find it. He's freaking out, drives back into town, totally scared that his son is now going to be killed. And then he gets a kid, he gets a call from the kidnapper and the kidnapper is like, what gives? How come you didn't drop the money? And he's like, I tried to, but the second note wasn't there. Kidnappers say, okay, we're going to give you one more chance. And so they gave him another thing. He drives out, finds the note, excuse me, finds the little flag, finds the tin can, finds a note, goes to the next place, finds the flag, finds the tin can, finds the note. And it says, drive to this next place. Uh, turn on your dome light, get out of the car, and start walking back down the road. And George's dad is about 100 yards away, and he hears this noise behind him, and he looks back, and he sees this figure jump out of the bushes, jump into the car, and drive off. And there you go. Kidnappers got 200000 bucks. Was there any attempt by the FBI or police to, to follow them at all? Nope. Because the warehouser said, "Don't you dare!" But now that the money was in the where, now that the money was in the kidnappers' hands, then became the biggest manhunt in Northwest history, and it was massive. They they went everywhere. Seven a full seven percent of the entire FBI came to S Seattle and Tacoma to uh, to help and find the kidnappers. So George was released unscathed. He was. He was. Uh, in there. So they they got their money, and so now they got a. They they were being honorable. They were going to give George back, but they never really thought things through far enough in advance to really think about where they were going to drop him off. So driving from Spokane back to Seattle, they were making it up as they went along. Where do you want to drop them off? I don't know. Where do you think we should drop them off? And they finally decided to drop them off out in the woods on a timber road right near where they had him in the ground. And so they dropped him off there on this timber road. They gave him a blanket and they gave him a dollar bill. And they said, here you go, George. Your dad will be here to pick you up. And they drove away. Well, the, George's dad wasn't going to come to pick him up because George's dad didn't know that he'd been dropped off anywhere. So George is sitting there in the dark and it's raining in the forest. 
And he waits for like a couple of hours and finally said, this is stupid. I'm out of here. And he starts walking and he walks miles on this timber road in the dead of night. And he stumbles across a farmhouse and it's about five o'clock in the morning, five or six in the morning. And he knocks on the farmhouse door and the farmer answers the door and he says, I'm George Warehouser. Will you get me to my folks house? So this farmer wakes up early morning, opens his door, and here is the kid who's been on the front page of every newspaper in America standing on his porch <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere. And so he was like, yes. So they pile George into their old Model T and they start driving back towards Tacoma. And they get about as far, about halfway. They get about halfway. They get to this town called Renton. And so the farmer decides he's going to call the Warehouser family because evidently you can just call the Warehouser family. <laughs> and so he goes <laughs> to a gas station and calls the Warehousers. Now at the Warehouser house, the FBI had this phone system set up and there was always a person there, an agent, ready to take any call. And the phone system failed utterly, completely failed. The phone rang one time and then it stopped ringing and it didn't work anymore. But from the farmer's perspective, it was still ringing. He could hear it ringing and it rang and rang and rang and rang. And he kept listening to it for something like four minutes. Nobody picked it up. But at the warehouse or house, the FBI agent said, nope, it rang one time and that was it. And when he picked up the phone, there was dead silence. So then the farmer says, well, okay, this is dumb. I'm gonna call the police. So he calls the police and says, I've got George Warehouser and I'm gonna take him back to his parents' house. Now, here's where it gets kind of a he said, he said situation. Do you believe the FBI or do you believe the reporter? The reporter, guy by, by the name of Dreher, he, John Dreher, he's a golf reporter for the Times, okay? Oldest reporter on the staff. And he claims that they got a hot tip, his publisher got a hot tip that George had been, been let go. And then so he went, uh, you know, he heard that the, that the police knew that George was on his way back from Issaquah to Seattle. Okay, now what the police say, the FBI says, is that the reporter was at the police station and overheard the phone call and went, oh my gosh, that's where George is. He got a cabbie. And then he took off and they intercepted George before the FBI could. <laughs> so the cabbie and the reporter are driving down the highway looking for a, T, a Model T coming the opposite direction. And they go and there they, here, comes, here comes a Model T up the highway. And the reporter's like, looks in the back seat, or actually they doesn't have a back seat, looks in the front seat next to the driver and he can see George in the front seat. And he's like, pull around, drive around. There they are, go after them. <laughs> and so the cabbie and the reporter chase after the Model T, make them pull over, insinuate to the farmer that he's with the police, gives the farmer five bucks, farmer hands George over, no questions asked. The reporter then puts George in the back seat of the cab below window level, sits on the floor in the back seat of the cab below window level, tells the cabbie, drive back to Tacoma, taking back roads and kind of drive a little bit on the slow side. And then he interviewed George for the biggest scoop of the year. How was George at this point? I mean, he must have been exhausted. He was in surprisingly good spirits. He was just glad to be, you know, uh, on his way home. But according to the article and according to George, when I spoke with him, he was doing okay. He was doing okay. So what was the family reunion like? Oh, my goodness. Big deal. Family was over, overwhelmed, overjoyed. And of course, the reporter Dreher thought for sure he was in trouble, thought he was going to get tossed in the clink. 
<laughs> for, for beating the FBI to the punch. Um, but uh, that didn't happen. He, he, he lucked out. But yeah, so then, of course, there's the big dog and pony show afterwards. The media is all over the place. While this was going on, Georgia's family's home was like the biggest tourist attraction in the state of Washington. There would be cars just lying down the street, slowly driving by so they can say that's George Warehouser's house. And people would steal flowers out of their yard as souvenirs. And police were all camped out around it. And so here's the dog and pony show. George is standing in front of uh, the reporters and the reporters are peppering him with questions. And, oh my goodness, you should see the stuff that they wrote. The, the, the writing style back in 1935 was so different than it is now. They're fawning over George, just absolutely falling all over themselves, talking about, you know, what a stand-up young man, and he is like a breath of fresh air and, and a beam of sunlight and throwing his shoulders back. And, oh, my goodness, it's just amazing. But here is another one of those little golden nuggets that I stumbled across. After the dog and pony show with the media, George goes back into the house and he goes up to the second floor and they've got this little uh, little deck up there. And he's sitting up there and he's playing with his pet white mice. And a reporter happened to be standing underneath this little portico and he could overhear George talking to the mice. And he heard George saying to the mouse or the mice, I'm so sorry that I had to leave you, but it couldn't be helped. Ah, uh, that's sweet. Yeah. Exactly. The mice were a big deal to him. So you actually got to talk to George. <laughs> How did you make that happen? Because from everything that I've read about the family, they're very private about this, right? Very much so. When it, The articles that I read um, usually had something to the effect of, George doesn't like to talk about it. So it took me a while to track George down. But when I finally did, I, I called this number. It was a, evidently a, a number where you leave a message and they check the, the messages like once a week. And I left a message saying, Hi, this is Brian Johnston. I'd like to write a story about your, um, your kidnapping. And, uh, you know, unless it's a really sensitive subject for you. And three days later, I get a, a voicemail from George saying, Brian, this is George Warehouser. Happy to talk with you. It's not a sensitive subject at all. It happened a long time ago. And I'm like, holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I talked with him and we arranged a time for me to come down to his house. Very nice house down in Tacoma. And I get down there and he's sitting out back on, by the lake and uh, I go up and chat, start chatting with him and he and his daughter. And we went inside and sat in the sunroom and we just talked for a couple of hours. And he was just, he was chatty and he was friendly and he got a big kick out of seeing old newspapers with his picture on the front back when he was nine years old. And uh, I asked him, I said, George, how, how old are you right now? And he says, uh, this was two years ago when I spoke with him. And he says, I'll be 94 next month. And I'm looking at him like, George, I should look so good when I'm 94. And I meant it too. Guy looked great. Guy looked great. But he's 96 years old now. And evidently he's still around. Um, obviously not doing as well. Um, but he's, he's still alive and kicking. But uh, when I, the last thing he said when I interviewed him, he says, Brian, how long is it going to take you to write this book? And I said, well, if I can write it and find a publisher, it'll probably take two years. He says, Brian, I'm almost 94 years old. Write fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I assume you got a copy to him. I did. Yeah, I did. I haven't heard back, but yes, I sent a copy to him. So this is an interesting time for J. Edgar Hoover. Most of the Barker Carpus gang is, is out of commission, but Elvin Carpus is still on the lam. Creepy Carpus. Yeah, Elvin Creepy Carpus. And, and as you remind us in your book, he is public enemy number one. So, so Carpus has planned a couple of successful kidnappings at this point. Uh -huh. Plus, he's Hoover's arch nemesis. Yeah. <laughs> 
really one of the last major Midwest bank robbing gangsters out there. So there are many that suspect that he is involved in this as well. Everybody thought it was Carpus. Everybody. The police did. The FBI did. The general public did. The newspapers. It was astonishing. Again, the way stories were written back in the 1930s is very, very different. Uh, They did not really care so much about uh, checking their facts. Let's just say that. I read articles where they flat out just said, it's Carpus. We know it's Carpus. And the FBI are going to get him, even though Carpus had nothing to do with it. He had nothing to do with it. Um, but he was, he was the most logical guess. It never crossed people's minds that it was, you know, a bank robber and a, and a petty criminal. So how did investigators connect this trio to the crime? What was the smoking gun? Uh, it was a 20-cent cigarette case. That's how they got caught. I don't want to go into too much detail, but it was a 20 cent cigarette case uh, that was being purchased as a birthday present. And that's what brought them down. And what would come to haunt them as well would be the serial numbers on the ransom bills, which had been one of their, their demands early on. Which is such a, which is such a stupid demand because now... They didn't say anything about the serial numbers. They just said they want them unmarked bills. But, but obviously the FBI, they kept track of every serial number, every, all 20,000 of the bills they tracked. And that took to uh, put together a list of every serial number took something like over 4,000 hours of work that they had to pull off in like, you know, five days. Uh, and they did. And, you know, that's, that was what led to their downfall. So two members of this criminal trio, the couple, the Whaley's, are captured first. William Mahan lasts longer. We, we can save his arrest for readers. But, but can you talk about the Whaley's and how they were caught, their trial, and the, and the outcome of the trial? Yeah. Uh, so... William Mahan, he's on the lam. He's on the lam for a year. And how he escaped police is a pretty terrific story in and of itself. But again, I won't go into that. That'll leave something to the imagination. But Harmon and Margaret are captured. And Harmon just said, guilty, guilty, put me in prison. Let's get this done. And Margaret said the same thing, even though she had virtually nothing to do with the crime other than knowing about it a couple of days into it and not telling anybody. But the, the judge like, wait a minute, you're going to plead guilty to a crime that you really didn't do much. You didn't really participate in. And she said, yes. He's like, why would you do that? And she's like, I cannot imagine my husband being in prison and me being out free. Okay. That's how indoctrinated she was. And the judge is like, no, that's stupid. No, I'm not going to let you do that. You're going to plead not guilty. And this is going to go to trial. And what a trial. Oh, my goodness. What a trial. Yes. So Harmon, he went off to Alcatraz for 45 years. When they eventually captured William Mahan, he went off to Alcatraz for 60 years. And then Margaret's trial like I said, Margaret's trial was something else. And I'll share one little piece of information about Margaret's trial. She's being defended by a very capable lawyer. He was the former Seattle mayor, actually. And he decided that the best defense was to portray Margaret as a complete idiot. And he was on her side. That was his defense. Margaret Whaley is a complete moron. She's an absolute rube. She's an idiot. She's as stupid as a box of rocks. One other piece of information I have to share that's really interesting. While this is all going on, the backdrop to this whole case is a humongous uh, lumber strike going on in the state of Washington. And so while this kidnapping is going on and while the trial is going on, 
there are riots in the streets and there's national guardsmen out on the streets with bayonets and people are shot and cars and buildings are dynamited while this is all going on. So it makes a terrific backdrop to the crime. And despite this very noble proclamation by Margaret that she'll do time alongside her husband because she loves him so much, the day of her release from prison, and she files for divorce immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, she did. So your book does not read like a traditional nonfiction history book. You use a writing device called representative dialogue. C- can you explain what to my listeners what that is? Yeah. Um, we wanted to make it, to give it, bring it a little bit more to life. Um, so it's just not facts and figures and information. I, I culled the information from over 2,500 pages of FBI documents and over 200 newspaper articles. It was funny when uh, the FBI sent me 2,500 pages of documents, they said, you want some more? And I'm like, uh, no, this will be plenty. Thank you very much. So anything that took place in the courtroom, any dialogue you see in the book, during the the trial, that is verbatim. That is precisely what was said. And there are also instances throughout the book where I use dialogue that was recorded, um, that was, you know, that's what they said. But there are other situations where we put in dialogue between the people that we simply interpreted uh, based on the information I was able to ascertain about these people of, of, you know, what the situation was like, what they would say to one another. So we created dialogue to have conversations, but we never, never played fast and loose with the facts. All the facts are absolutely accurate. Just some of the conversations around situations, we, we created conversations to fill in the holes. So uh, tell us about the release of your book and your website for people who want to know more. All right, so the, the, uh, the book comes out on Tuesday, September 14th. And again, it's called Deep in the Woods, uh, the 1935 kidnapping of nine-year-old George Weyerhaeuser, heir to America's mightiest timber dynasty. And uh, you, can, you, can, you can pre-order it in advance. Go to amazon.com or Barnes & Noble, or you can go to uh, brianrjohnston.com. And uh, there's a little bit more information about the book there. I should probably say Brian with a Y, Johnston with a T. And I'll, and I'll put a link to the website on the episode description. Well, thank you again. It's been fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks so much. And I hope people in, uh, pick up the book. It is an astonishing story. It, and if I'm wrong about this, it is the most wrong I've ever been about anything in my life. Again, I have been speaking to Brian Johnston. His book is called Deep in the Woods, the 1935 kidnapping of nine-year-old George Weyerhaeuser, heir to America's mightiest timber dynasty. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.